Hey guys, it's Sean Delaney. And today on the What Got You There podcast, I sit down with Jim DeSico, who's the co-founder, executive chairman, and chief brand officer of Super Coffee, one of the fastest growing brands in the last five years. Now, if you want an incredible conversation that dives into what it takes to build a brand, how to build community, how to push your limits, how to test yourself, and how to keep evolving as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, and as a person, then please enjoy this conversation with Jim DeSico. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Jim, welcome back to What Got You There. How are you doing today, man? Sean, I'm good, brother. It's good to, good to hang out for, uh, what is this, round three? Round three. You're on episode 53 and 162 so this will be around 350 so yeah man it's been so fun to see the evolution both of you the company over those years but i'm just wondering for you like in this current chapter in your life right like we we explored on episode 53 then 162 where do you feel you're at today that is different from some of the past years that you've been on it's a good question man i think i am uh more patient more poised uh less reactive than, than I have been. Um, I think my episode 53 self, that was probably 2018, would would kick my 2023 self in the ass and just say, look, you've gotten comfortable. You know, you've gotten complacent. Like get your ass back in stores and stock the shelves and do the work. Like you don't do not think that that you can you can ignore the stuff that got you here. And I'm kind of going through that realization right now. And this summer is going to be a step back for me and my brothers where we put in the effort and do the the, the work from the, from the field level that we did in 2016, 17, and 18 that we kind of got away from in 2021 and 2022. For you, is that mostly about just battling your own ego? I don't know about ego. I, I think that like we all kind of have this, this perception of like, where okay the business is over 100 employees we just raised 100 million dollars like I, i'm an executive now right i can i can kind of take a step back but when you do that you neglect the things that got you to where you were like there's nothing i can do from the office that's going to go build my business in grocery stores and it's like it's hum it's a humbling reminder that the work doesn't stop you know the more the more coffee you sell the more shelves you have to stock so we're just getting back back to the basics this summer. I love it, man. Back to the basics. One of the things you were saying is that you build up your poise and patience. How do you do that? Is that just a, a factor that comes in through time or is that something you actually worked on? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. Um, it kind of feels a, a bit calloused. You know, I, I, I feel like you, you you take your lumps and you get conditioned to it. Uh, but before we hit record, we were talking about, I, I ran my first marathon in, in February of this year. That definitely helps, you know, just doing things where you have no choice but to be with the road for three hours, you know, and and I think it's so easy to be distracted today and and people who multitask like that's my my biggest flaw of task switching from text messages to emails to Instagram to meetings like I'll be in a meeting sending emails and it's not productive for anything. And I think do forcing myself to be focused and be present through things like endurance training has, has helped me a lot in, at work. I want to dive into two mindsets that go into your endurance training. First, just the motivation and internal drive to actually sign up for the marathon, right? To even go out day one to start training. That's the first thing I want to cover. And then I would love to hear about the internal monologue going on in your head called at mile 22. And what are you saying? So first, what do you do to get yourself motivated to actually take action and sign up and do those things? Because so many people don't go through that initial friction to start making the changes to get them to where they want to go. So how do you manage that? Yeah, man, I think I, I've said this to you multiple times over the years, like I never had any interest in running a marathon. You know, I was like, but to me, that's that seems like it's awful. You know, I was a, a college running back. I, I'm a sprinter at, at like through and through running 26 miles sounds miserable. And I think Jordan, my, my little brother, Jordan ran the New York city marathon in November. Uh, my, my girlfriend, Allison ran the Austin marathon a couple of years ago. And I just started to get the itch kind of more of like a FOMO thing. 
And then certainly an ego thing where I was like, can I do this? You know, can I, can I show myself? And, and look, I'm not that, you know, me, I'm not the type of guy that's like signing up for a race just to see if I can finish it. It's like, how fast can I go? Yeah, yeah. And uh, to, to hit a fast pace, like a marathon, you can't just show up to a marathon, right? You got to train for it. So I think putting that on the calendar six months in advance and, and going through a, a 16 week training program uh, was, was awesome for me. You know, like it wasn't just a race. It was four months of getting ready for the race. Then what about when you're actually in that race, mile 20, 21, 22? I, I know that's not easy, especially when you're shooting for a three hour marathon. So yeah. when, when the challenge hits in, what's happening internally for you, Jim? Yeah. So I, the, everybody talks about the wall at mile 20, right? You hit this wall at mile 20 and mile 18, I felt great. Mile 20 comes along. I felt great. You know, I was expecting to hit this wall and it never really came. And then, so I, my, from like mile 20 through 25, I was throwing down good times. I think it got real difficult for me at mile 24. And then basically what I said was like, I got two miles left. That's less than 15 minutes of running. You know, like if I, if I book it, I could, I could be done in 13 minutes and like, you could do anything for 13 minutes, you know? And at that point, like both of my toenails were falling off. My, my, my leg was cramping up. I was out of goose. I was out of salts. I was like, just get across the finish line. And it was emotional, you know, like I, I had tears and, and cause in my head, I was like, wow, I'm going to hit my pace. I'm, I'm two miles away from hitting my goal time. And like, that was I was overwhelmed with four months of having this goal, having this expectation, and then at being so close to doing it. And I, I got there. My, my goal, my, my actual finish time was three hours and one second. So I was, I was proud of the performance, but it hurt that I didn't, I didn't have a two in front of that. What about the, the challenges and stresses that you feel running a company, right? You're going to hit that really challenging time. You're going to hit that internal mental blockage. What are you doing during those times? Yeah, I think two things. What One quote that I've been saying a lot lately, a little mantra is nothing is as good or as bad as it seems, you know, and, and we could get faced with a, a terrible news every day. You know, just yesterday we produced a, a new batch of mocha latte, our, our, our mocha flavor in a 32 ounce multi-serve format. It's going to be a great product for us. It didn't pass the quality inspection at the factory. So <laughs> like 30,000 cases of product need to be destroyed. We're, we're pushing off delays and we're like, look, one, this, this too shall pass. It's not as good as bad or as bad as it seems. Guess what? We got a lot of vanilla latte, right? Let's go sell that. You know? So I think I am, I am not, I am not interrupted or disappointed by bad news anymore. Um, and we immediately get into action. Like how do we solve this problem? Yeah, one of the lines I love is you never know what worse luck, bad luck saved you from. So you never know like what resources you're going to have to dive into and, and develop because of these things. But I love for, for you, I mean, managing a massive team and you have the internal resources and emotional intelligence to be able to navigate that. To say, you know what, I'm not going to let this affect me. Let's get forward facing. Let's start moving forward. How do you do that with your team and maybe the people who haven't developed the emotional resilience and mental abilities that you have? I think sh doing it with them, you know, showing them, leading them, right? I I I'm reading this book right now. It's called Follow Me to Hell. It's about Leander McNelly. He's a uh, he's a Texas Ranger, sort of policing the frontier when Texas was its own republic. And uh, he, he, he says something. He was like, look, guys, I will never ask you to go to battle. I will lead you into battle. All I can ask you to do is follow me and I will I will get you home. And and I think that's sort of, sort of the mentality we take here is like, there's not a job at this company that my brothers and I haven't done over the years. That doesn't mean we're the best at everything, but I think we do have empathy for people who do what they do, especially on the front lines from a, a sales perspective. Um, so I think not only leading by example, but taking the lessons and the privileges that were, were afforded as founders and communicating those to the team, right? Like the team loves it when they hear stories of, Hey, I was with Jesse Itzler last weekend and he taught me X, Y, Z, you know, it, like th they love hearing that and they love being a part of that. And so do I, I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's awesome. And even lessons from this conversation, you know, like what, what you just said about uh, bad luck, saving you from worse luck. Like I'm going to pass that on to my team on a Monday morning call next week. And people are going to love that. Talk more about the communication amongst your team. Even a few minutes ago, you were saying, yeah, it's this little mantra I say. So I'm just wondering what you've done well to communicate really effectively amongst your team. Yeah, I think 
if you talk to our team, there's going to be a couple things that are, are constant themes, right? When I say at, at Super Coffee, we say often that our team is our barrier to entry. That is a, a rallying cry that the, the the team is going to work their asses off. That's what's going to set, differentiate us from from the competition, from from our competitors. Um, we say work hard and be nice to people. You know, you've heard that quite a bit. We didn't we didn't coin that phrase. That's literally on on posters at Target right now. Uh, and then other things like our our core values encapsulated by coach, curious, optimistic, ambitious, compassionate, humble. The reason I pick those three things is we often repeat those things that are super simple. We say them every single week. So it becomes a part of our culture and uh, becomes a part of our fiber as an organization. Because I mean, look, I read your Momentum Monday every single week and there's new quotes in there. There's new books, there's new interviews. I could throw out new quotes every single week to the team. But then the question is, what is that single threaded fiber that runs through the organization that we can always sort of come back to as our core? So I, I'm as tempted as I am to introduce new concepts, I think I need to have the discipline to say, to be like the chief repeat officer, like repeating the important priorities, the important goals, the important quotes and cultures. Uh, so that, that, that repetition has become a big part of what I, what I'm working on. Yeah. This makes me think of a story that was told on this podcast by one of my good friends, former Navy SEAL. And he was talking about one of the times that he went out on the range with one of his 20 year commanders. So this guy, SEAL team six has fired over a million bullets. They get out on the range. And I know I've told this story on pretty much every podcast because I love it. Gets out on the range. This guy's fired a million bullets in his life. What does he do? Single bullet in the chamber, does his peripheral scans, takes one shot, sets his gun down. Mike Burns, the Navy SEAL, is my friend who was telling me the story. He says, Sean, that is the first thing they teach you day one at SEALs. And this guy literally has fired more bullets than anyone else in the Navy SEALs right now. And what does he do every time he gets out on the range? He does the exact same fundamentals and basics. And I'm telling this story because everything that you've been saying so far is, you know what? What I'm focusing on as business leader is getting back to the basics. How do I communicate my, to my team? It's not saying a million new things. It's saying the consistent basics again and again. And I love that. I love that you hit on this. And I'm wondering, why don't more people do that? Why do we find that we're constantly trying to get away from the fundamentals? It's a good question, man. I think I think we're looking for a silver bullet, right? I think mm -hmm. we're looking for that one thing that's going to unlock some some amazing growth or some huge innovation that's going to change the, the the course of our trajectory. And I, I remember you you told that story on your episode with Diana Chapman a couple of weeks ago, and it got me thinking. Like we we spoke to a Navy SEAL a couple of years back, and he was like, "There's nothing sh extraordinary about Navy SEALs. They are are the best at the basics." Right when they storm a building in in a, a, a war zone, they practice the steps of entering that door a thousand times, like literally the bit the the very basics. And for us over the last couple of years, I mean, we we had a lot of tailwinds from just the venture capital being being everywhere. You know, like the high growth was rewarded with high valuations and big funding rounds. And with that, you were you were inspired to grow or you almost had the pressure to grow, to live up to expectations. And I think when you chase growth, you make bad decisions. You know, we launched over 50 products, creamers, energy drinks, K-cups, ground coffee. And we, we, we spent so much money on marketing. We hired a big team. And now this year, or really over the last 12 months, we discontinued 30 SKUs. We reduced our team by 50%. We reduced our marketing by 75%. And now today, our business looks a lot like it did in 2020. You know, it's it's just a much more efficient business back to the basics. So it's not that the last two years were a waste. It's that they were a great reminder that in order for us to be successful, we need to exceed at the foundation, right? We need to exceed at the, 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 the fundamentals. Um, so it, it has been a sort of painful transition, but it's a great reminder that like all we need to do to win is the, be great at the basics. As a leadership team, how do you make those tough decisions, right? Like cutting back on all of those massive categories, letting people go, all of those things. How do you work on that as an internal team at Super Coffee? Yeah, I think it comes, it's a, it's a variety of things, right? It comes from goals. You know, if our goal is to be acquired someday, which I think that is, is the likely outcome. And that's what our investors would like to see what are the parameters to be an exciting acquisition target? And, and generally in the beverage industry lately, it is a hundred million in net sales. That's sort of the proof of concept. Uh, and you have to be break even or on a very clear path toward profitability. And I mean, last year we, we 
only did 70 million in sales and we lost over $20 million, right? Like, so the, the, the question is like, we were on a path that wasn't going to get us to those standards, right? The, the, the standards of expectation to be an a, a attractive target. Uh, so I think starting with your goals and where you're headed definitely informs those, those conversations. I think uh, reacting or, or adjusting to as the macro environment and ad adjust the macro economy, right? This is no longer an economy that rewards growth over profit. So what can we do to, to protect the bottom line at the expense of the top line, right? Like we're, our, we're going to decline in revenue 2023 over 2022, but we're going to improve EBITDA by $20 million, right? And, and if this was 2021, I would say, why the hell would we ever decline revenue? That's a ridiculous thing, you know? So I, I think adjusting to the times and adjusting to the goals is, is really critical um, and doing it quickly, right? I think it, it, it often takes people six to 12 months too long to make the moves that they should have made 12 months ago. Why is that? You don't want to admit it, right? Like you don't want to, to, to break the status quo. You know, you don't want to, to break, like you don't want to accept something until you have no other choice, right? Like for us, raising money is is not an option right now. So we need to control our own destiny by becoming a profitable company. Uh, and and I think that once you once you see the cash in the bank getting to a certain point, you have no choice but to make dramatic moves. I'm wondering about the underlying structure for you internally that has allowed you to continue to grow and evolve, right? Like if you if you're seeing the forest through the trees on that on those last few minutes, it's that you know what you had to look in the mirror, face harsh realities, learn and evolve from them and take better steps to progress where a lot of people don't do that. And so I'm wondering just for you, what has allowed you to do that consistently well? Oh man, I think one, one thing, my process is I will talk to 10 people, 10 experts before I make a decision. Right. And, and some people don't, don't like that. You know, we, we, we hired a CEO in December and he's like, Jimmy, why, why do you talk to so many people? Do you not trust that we're on the, the right path? I'm like, no, it has nothing to do with that. Like, I, I want to hear what 10 people say, because if I ask the same question to 10 people, I'm going to get 10 different answers. And then I come up with my own move going forward. So I think checking, checking my intentions with people who have been there, done that, who have experience that I don't have is, is my number one move. Uh, I think having faith in myself, which isn't always an easy thing. Um, and I, I've been working on this since 2020. I, I, since 2020, I've seen a therapist once a week, every week. And that's that's helped me evolve and find confidence in in, in myself. Um, and you know that our, our setup at Super Coffee is unique, where we have three founders who happen to be three brothers. And although my title was CEO, I wasn't the single... Uh, autonomous authority, right? Like I didn't ha have decision-making power or, or veto power over Jake and Jordan. Uh, so I think setting up the accountability within the organization is critical to, to decision-making because if Jordan wants to launch an energy drink and I don't, it's a stalemate that, that wastes a lot of time. And, and uh, that's part of the reason we appointed a CEO who we, who we trust. Had there been any exercises or questions that you've done since 2020 that have really helped you develop that internal confidence? Man, it's a good question. I'm pausing on that. Um, I, I actually did this event back in January and it was uh, a, a Navy SEAL training session in the backwoods in Northwest Georgia. It was uh, with Chad Wright, former Navy SEAL. 25 of us went out there and it, it basically 25 strangers. And the whole goal is to build a team of these 25 strangers. And, and you don't know what the goal is. You're, you're provided with very little information. And throughout the week weekend, Chad caused a, a ton of chaos. You know, there was, he was like, why aren't we organizing? Why is there no chain of command? Why is, why is none of this happening? And I was looking around the group and everybody, like there was chaos. And I was like, dang, somebody's got to step up here. And I was waiting for somebody to step up. And then I realized like, oh man, that's me, right? I got to be the guy that steps up. And I stepped up. I, we, we, we established a chain of command, you know, and, and that was, that was a, a great eye opener for me that, uh, without accountability, without a clear leader, there will be chaos everywhere. And that's given me a lot of confidence these last six months to step up, to, to set the direction, to set the agenda, uh, where oftentimes I think we're all tempted to look to our left and to our right for somebody to give us the direction that we want. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's my responsibility to set that direction at, at Super Coffee.
that's interesting. I was literally having this conversation yesterday with a, with a leader just talking about if there's no vision for the team, the people are going to perish, right? Like they're not going to know what to do, where to go. But I'm wondering for you, during those times that you're battling uncertainty within yourself, all right, where you don't exactly know the direction to do. And what I'm hearing a lot now is they're advising a lot of leaders to be extremely vulnerable, to open up about you're scared, you don't know what to do, and to be vulnerable for your team. That's like a buzzword right now. But I'm wondering for you, have you found that to be more effective to be vulnerable, to admit how scared you are, how it's the unknown, you don't know what to do, or just almost, I got this guys, like, let's jump, like, follow me. I've got this. Which one would you do? I, I think it's a yes. And like, I, I'm certainly vulnerable to advisors, to board members, to, to our, our C-suite in, in meetings where we're, we're making hard decisions, but from my perspective with a hundred employees and, and mostly remote, I think, I don't think people want to hear me say, guys, I'm afraid right now. Like, I, I'm not sure how we're going to get out of this. I don't know where to go from here, but let's go together. Right. It's, I, I think it could be a little bit of that. I think it's like, Hey, th this sucks. You know, we had to lay off 30 people last week. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for those who are gone and we have a freaking job to do. Follow me. Let's get this shit done. Uh, and so I, I, I think it's both, but you can't just come on and be vulnerable without a solution because then people are, it, it creates a lot of fear. Yeah, no, I love that response. And I love that you added clarity there. Cause I think so many people just hear you got to be vulnerable as a leader. And I think you added some great context that a lot of times that not is not the right answer we're looking for. You were mentioning on that Navy SEAL weekend, what are some of the other foundational keys that you found for just building a team and building a team quickly, right? Like if we've got a young Jim DeSico entrepreneur in 2016 ish looking to build a company, what are the basics you're focusing on at that time to set yourself up for success later? Yeah, I, I, I think chain of command, as it relates to that weekend, chain of command was was critical. So I was I was the leader, my, my title was LPO, I think it's Lieutenant Petty Officer. I had two squad leaders beneath me. And then on each squad, there was a navigator, there was a comms person, there was a second nav, and we would get these these coordinates and we'd have to plot them on the map and then we'd have to track through the woods using a compass to get from one objective to the next and i found my my nose in the map and i was like okay there's the the the, the navigator would plot the coordinates i was like all right yeah maybe we go this way and chad the, the the navy seal pulled me over he was like jimmy why the hell is your nose in the map like that's not your job right that's your that's your team's job and i was i was two levels below right like my when you establish this chain of command, you're really only supposed, I was only supposed to talk to my squad leaders. They communicate down to the, to their squads beneath them. And that was a great reminder that like, I think a lot of, as leaders, we're problem solvers. You know, we want to do the work we want to help out, but that's what you have great teams for, you know, and, and you got to trust your teams. You got to empower your teams to get the job done. And you have to communicate the, the, the proper chain of command, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that is what establishes order and hierarchy. So me telling the squad leaders that, Hey, we need to pick up the pace squad leaders, tell it to the navigator. And then the whole team gets going. So that was a, a, a good reminder to, to know my role and, and not get involved in, in the work that was uh, my, my teammates were responsible for. What about the rest of that team? I'm just thinking about organizational culture. And I think you've done an incredible job of building a really strong and great culture. And I think each culture is new unique and certain people will thrive in one culture and they wouldn't thrive in another culture. So I'd love to know how you thought about the culture that you guys were building and how you allowed the authenticity of the three brothers to come into the culture you were building. Yeah, I I, I think we weren't intentionally building a corporate culture, right? Like to, to me, there's a, a couple of things that are related. I think culture is an extension of the human beings who work there and their values, right? right? And brand is a reflection of the culture. Right. So, so super coffee, it says positive energy on the front of every one of our bottles. And like, that's become our culture here at super coffee. So I, I think the brand is a reflection of the culture. And I, for us, like we've never been through, like, we don't have our MBAs, you know, we never had jobs before. I've never been through like corporate training on how to build a culture. Uh, so we did what, what our mom taught us to do. And it was work, work hard and be nice to people. And I think when you do that and you establish a vision for where you want to go and what you want to be, you attract people who share those values. And as you put together humans who share the same values, that becomes a culture, right? And, and, and culture is not just what you attract. It's also what you tolerate, right? And, and when we say work hard and be nice to people, if you work hard and you're an asshole, you will not work here for very long, right? And, and conversely, if, if you're nice, but you're not getting your job done, 
maybe we can be friends, but you're not going to have a job here either. Right. So I think recognizing those who don't fit and moving quickly on them protects the culture for everybody else because it shows what is tolerated, what is rewarded and what is not. Mm. You have any good stories of how you were trying to assess someone, how they would fit within the company throughout the years. Any way you've done that in a unique or interesting way? Yeah, there's there's one, man. This is this goes way back to 2016. It was just me and my brothers building the business and and uh we were doing everything. And we got to the point where we're like, wow, I think it's time to hire somebody. Like, oh my gosh, we're building a business, right? We're gonna go hire an employee. And then we're like, wait, what what qualifications does our first employee need? You know, like what is this person going to need to do? What experience do they need to have? And I was like, look, I don't think it, I don't think skills or experience matter here. All I know is that this is super difficult, that this requires long hours, this requires perseverance. And uh, we we had this guy reach out. He was working for a government agency, he was my age. Uh, so back then we were 22, 23 years old. He was like, Hey, I, I love your company. I've been following the startup story. Uh, I want, I want to get involved. He had no sales experience, didn't know anything about beverage. And I was like, all right, man, meet me at a trail in the woods at 6 AM on Saturday. And that that's all I told him. And he showed up and we just started running through the dark, jumping over logs, through the trees. He rolled his ankle and we ran for like four miles and I was, I was going pretty hard. And I just wanted to see if he was going to quit or complain or come up with an excuse. And he didn't. And he got the job. And now today, he's one of our vice presidents of sales. He's been with us for six years. Uh, and he's persevering every day. Like we're jumping over logs together every single day as we build this business together. How do you assess people's internal drive and if they're going to not quit today? I don't I don't think you're taking <laughs> people out of the, yeah, if I did the that four today, mile, I would, 6 a.m. trail. I would be, I would be fired. <laughs> Um, I think today I rely heavily on recommendations and referrals, you know, like you could, you could screen somebody in an interview, but I interview two or three references as hard as I interview the candidate because anybody can put on their best self or their best face for a 30 minute to 60 minute conversation. And they'll tell you everything you want to hear, but it's really tough to determine that when you're in a foxhole with somebody, how are they going to respond to adversity, to enemy fire, to all kinds of challenges thrown at you? Um, and I, I think really grilling references has become a critical part to our hiring process. Any of the questions uh, that you've found a lot of value in over the years in terms of asking one of the references? Yeah, I think just two general ones that are you can really drill in on depending on how they answer is, when Sean was at his best, what did that look like? When Sean was at his worst, what did that look like? You know, because it forces it forces the person being asked the question to come up with a time when you were at your worst, you know, and and a lot of times like your worst might have been you were distracted or or you didn't show up to work and you didn't tell anybody, you know, like it, depending on their answer, it can tell me a lot about that person. Right. And and one thing I've I've sort of I've came up with a rule over the last few years, depending on these answers, that is don't hire unlucky people, right? And an unlucky person is somebody who gets a flat tire on his way to work or his mom's sick and he can't come in or uh, so the, the kids are at home, they, they, they got off from school every day. Now look, I get it, that stuff happens, right? But it usually happens few and far between. If it happens every week, that's an unlucky person. And, and the unlucky person is probably a misnomer, right? To me, that's a person who creates excuses and is unreliable. Uh, but it's really unlucky to get a flat tire every freaking week, isn't it? You know, so I, I avoid unlucky people when I, I start to see patterns and trends like that. I love that. One of the, uh, the managers at Nike, when I worked there a long time ago, that was literally his final component when he was hiring his question mark to himself. Is this person lucky? Because to your point, exactly all of those things, they, they end up happening for the, the unlucky person. One of the things that's just been so obvious for me with an outsider's perspective on you and seeing this over years is just your ability to develop and evolve yourself, your mind, your body, relationships, community, everything. And I'm just wondering for you, do you think about that continual evolution for yourself? Even, even what you were mentioning here, you're like, I had this Navy SEAL retreat in January. I signed up for this marathon. I've got this. I'm, I'm just wondering for you, is, is this just like an intentional approach or is this just something you naturally do? Um, I, I, I think it's natural. I think... I need to be more intentional with the basics, you know, I, I, me chasing connections and chasing relationships and leveling up, I think is, is that 
looking not looking for the silver bullet but it's looking for innovation it's looking for things that will will make me better oftentimes at the expense of maintenance of the basics and being good at the basics so i need to do a better job of of staying grounded in the the fundamentals and the foundation um for me i think one of one one of my superpowers is the ability to connect with other people people who who have access or the ability to to show us the way or or open up a door to super coffee that we couldn't open on our own one example um is we, we are raising money right now even though i said that we, we we can't be in a position to uh and it was a couple a few weeks ago i was like where the hell are we going to raise money right nobody in the us is writing checks right now all of our investors have really closed their their purses you know and and uh for us i'm like we we got to go find a new source of of money so i was listening to uh the prof g podcast with scott galloway maybe a month or two ago and he was like, yeah, I was just at this event in Miami. It was a conference of all of these Middle Eastern, Saudi Arabian, United Arab Emirates funds, these investors in Miami investing in tech. And recent Horowitz was there. Adam Newman's new fund was there, all receiving money from, from the Middle East and in the UAE. And the UAE is right now they're, they're pumping $300 million worth of oil every single day. And they realize so that's where all their money comes from. It's 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 unbelievable amounts of money. I was in in Dubai and Abu Dhabi last week. I'll tell you I'll tell you about that in a second. But they they realize that in thirty years from now, that basin that they're pumping this oil from is going to run dry. You know, it's not a renewable energy source. So they're divesting and they're 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 diversifying the economy by investing in in all kinds of industries: commercial real estate, tech, startups, food and beverage, etc. So I was like, dang, I got to get to the UAE. Mm-hmm. Then I remembered we have one of our angel investors from twenty seventeen. I uh, met this guy at WeWork in Washington, D.C., and he put in a check for $15,000. He's plugged into the the Moroccan royal family. And I, I I saw on LinkedIn or something that he just moved to Abu Dhabi. So I hit him up. I was like, hey, Amin, like, do you have any connections over there? He was like, dude, I know every royal family. I know every investment fund. I know X, Y, Z. So I got on a plane last week. I flew to Dubai. I had six or seven meetings in Abu Dhabi. And all of that started from a Scott Galloway podcast. I'm like, shit, how do I get to the Middle East? You know, and, and you make a couple of calls and you get over there. Is there any hesitation for you? Or I'm wondering what that phase is like where you hear and you have the idea and then actually go into action. Like for you, one of the things that you can do is you can do that very quickly, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I don't take action on most of my ideas, you know, and, and you and I were talking a few months ago, I was like, Sean, I want to I want to start a newsletter called on brand, right? I'm now the chief brand officer, we hired a CEO. So I moved from CEO to chief brand officer, I think on brand is like, is this partnership on brand? And on brand is also philosophical, of like, what does it mean to build a brand? How does culture reflect brand, right? Like all of these different things. And I had so many ideas at the time. And you were like, dude, go for it. This is awesome. And six months later, I haven't written one word on brand. Uh, so I, I I think there are things like that that are good ideas, but I either don't become priorities or I don't have the courage to put pen to paper and, and make something happen. Um, I think when my back's against the ropes, that is when I'm inspired to jump into action the quickest. And Super Coffee is in a great spot, but I think having an extra 10 to 15 million in the bank right now would feel a lot better for everybody, which is why I was there was some urgency around the, these investor meetings overseas. If you look back over all the years, have you found the times that you actually do take extreme action is like what you said, your back is against the wall. And if so, if that's the case, I'm wondering, do you kind of think about that? Like that's your forcing function that, you know what, I'm really not going to take extreme action here until my back's against the wall. And you're kind of more attuned to those moments that really are dire circumstances. Yeah. I, that's right, man. Like it's, it's somebody needs to make a play who's going to make it right. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're down by a touchdown in the fourth quarter. We need to score a touchdown. Who's going to make it when you're up three scores and in, in the second quarter, like you're good to run the ball and get three yards of carry, you know? And, and that's kind of how most weeks go. Like I'm in the office, I'm having my meetings with my direct reports, you know, we're, we're sort of moving the ball down the field slowly, but it's not, if we don't score, we will lose this game. And in that situation, you got to find a way to break a tackle and get into the end zone. Um, so I, I I think in a dire situation, I, I can find a way to step up and make a play. There's a new stress. There's a new urgency. Um, like I, I'm in a different mentality than the day-to-day maintenance. Uh, so I don't know. I, I got to do a better job balancing both of those things of like 
keeping the maintenance and not always having to rely on something big, big happening. Walk me through that internal dialogue. I know I'd asked a lot about internal dialogue. <clears throat> when you need to score the winning touchdown, what's that like? Because so many people, they say, you know what? That's not for me. I don't want that. I'm just wondering for you, when times are dire, what is the internal dialogue dog like for Jim DeSico? Yeah, man. And it, it, it always comes down to raising money. You know, I've led sort of all of our, our fundraising efforts over the years. Thankfully, we haven't had to raise since 2021. But every raise before that, call it six or seven raises between seed and angel round, series A, B, C. Uh, it was, we're going to be out of money in six months, which means I needed to start raising money yesterday. And that is like, if we're going to be out of money in 12 months, I'm not putting a deck together. You know, I'm not I'm not getting ready to to put together my CRM of investors that I'm going to reach out to. But if we're going to be out of money in six months, that probably means we're going to be out of money in four months, which means I got to have a deck ready next week. And it's amazing. Like go, when I have 12 months to do something, I, I don't get any slides on paper. When I have a week to do something, I could build a 30 page deck that is tight. It's ready to go. You know, I load it into DocSent. Like I get all of this shit done. And then I do the outreach, I do the follow-ups, I stay on it and I just keep fishing until we we get somebody, something on the hook and then you got to get it in the boat, which is like the diligence process. So I, I I think, I don't know, it's probably from bad habits in college, right? If I had a paper due, I, I start writing it the night before and I, I, I make it happen. But um, I don't know. I, I, does that does that answer your question of, of like, yeah. I'm looking for no answers here. I'm just looking for clear pictures, right? I'm just each one of these interviews. Let's build a fucking mosaic here and see what this person is all about. And what can we, what, what from Jim's mosaic can I take to add to Sean's mosaic? That's what this entire thing is about. So if, if you operate in dire situations, I want to be able to take something from that. So I'm wondering for you, because what you've been able to do and the theme here is just your constant evolution and growth. And that's obviously taking place in the company as well. So you're talking about extreme situations where your back's against the wall. 10 seconds left, you want the ball. And you see these massive growth moments for you. But something that you've also done extremely well is just the consistency daily, right? Like I'm wondering for you, what do you prioritize daily? Because you were just traveling. But I guarantee you when you were traveling, you were prioritizing health, you were prioritizing fitness. So I'm just wondering, what are those consistent things you think about daily that you do no matter what, even if your back's not against the wall? Totally, yeah. So fitness, absolutely the the angel investor I mentioned to you who had the connections in Abu Dhabi I stayed with him uh he's a great guy uh he doesn't work out he's got an amazing gym at his facility and Dubai is it was a 15 hour flight and they're nine hours ahead of of Austin Texas where I live so I was all kinds of messed up I was only there for four days my my sleep schedule is way off I was on calls with my team at two in the morning and I was like, I got to get consistent sleep. You know, I got to find a way to get my sleep for on a trip like that. It's like six or seven hours. Ideally, I shoot for seven or eight. I got to get movement. You know, I got to sweat uh, every single day. I think in, the, in my first two days there, I worked out three times. And the guy I was staying with was shocked. Like he couldn't believe it. Like he's never been to his gym. And I was there three times in two days, which for you and me, like that's a, that's a normal thing. And that got me feeling great, right? Like that got me sweating. That got my, my head in a good place. Uh, and then the, the second thing is hydration and nutrition. You know, I was, I was slamming electrolytes. I was drinking a bunch of water. Um, and I wasn't eating sugar. You know, I was trying to do like, uh, grain bowls and salad bowls and things like that, just to, to sh stay fresh. I find when I eat a lot of, um, grain and bread and, and, and dairy and, and sugar, I get, I get all kinds of messed up, like more, more so than anything else. So I think fitness, sleep and nutrition, are non-negotiables for me yet every now and then I give in to, to cravings and, and lose the willpower to, to not have an ice cream after dinner. What stage did you develop this, this consistency, this approach to the fundamentals, this constant pushing and evolution? Um, I think the fitness has always been a part of it, right? Like you, you transition out of being a college athlete where you're, you're pretty much a full-time fitness person for four years it's, it's hard to lose that, right? You can't go from training for 30 hours a week to doing nothing. So like in the early years, 2016, 17, 18, right after school, right when we started super coffee, I would, I was more into weightlifting and, and it, my, my routine kind of reflected what, what college football strength looked like. Uh, and then I got into running and hybrid athlete stuff and endurance. And so like, I've always had like four to five workouts a week in a variety of, of, um, strength and endurance type stuff. 
Uh, and then nutrition. I mean, our, our whole mission at Super Coffee is to remove added sugar from America's diet. Uh, so we've flirted on and off with the keto diet, low sugar diets, things like that. Um, that's always been a part of it. I think sleep has gotten super important in the last two years, uh, 2021 and 2022. I, I, I would say I, I really started to prioritize sleep. Um, but one thing I want to be clear is like, I'm not very consistent. You know, I, I, I listen to a bunch of podcasts where people are like, yeah, my alarm goes off at 430. I'm in the cold tub by 445. I exercise for 50 minutes and then I journal. Like maybe I do that once a week, you know, but like my alarm's going off anywhere from 5 a.m. to 630 a.m. I have like this 90 minute window where I wake up. Some mornings I work out, some afternoons I work out. You know, I, I ideally I'm eating good during the week, but sometimes I'll order tacos and quesadillas for lunch and then I'll feel like shit in the afternoon, you know? So I, I am very much a human in, in that regard, um, which drives me crazy. Cause like, I know how good I feel when I eat well, yet I don't always eat well. Then for you, the times that you've been able to act on the things that you know, you should be acting on that are going to bring you to a, to a better version of yourself. What have been the differentiators for you? Uh, man. So the biggest thing, and this is more of a, a, a fortunate thing is, um, my, I, I've been dating my girlfriend, Allison for two years now, and that has unlocked so much potential, so much happiness, so much health and energy that I didn't know existed. Like before, before my relationship with Allison, I could work out every day. I could eat well, and I could get my eight hours of sleep. And I would still feel like shit, you know, I would still feel stressed or depressed or sad or discouraged or distracted. And now I can do all of those things and still be under immense amounts of stress, yet waking up next to her, spending time with her at night, you know, going going to, to, to sleep with her at night, like just having that social interaction, having another human, having that, that relationship uh, has made everything else a lot better. Um, so I, I, I think for... For the listeners out there who who do all of the right things, but aren't getting that social component, whether it's with a partner, a significant other, or a friend, the, the social piece to me has been the biggest unlock, more so than fitness, more so than di diet, more so than sleep. Would you have ever thought that would have been your answer 10 years ago? No, no. I, dude, before I met Allison, I was like, I had girlfriends for a few months here and there. You know, I was on dating apps every now and then. And I was kind of like, I'm good on my own, you know, like there's, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to compromise. You know, I'm not going to be in a marriage where I'm fighting with somebody and, and putting in the work and going into couples therapy. Like I look around and that's what so many people go through. And not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but I was like, I don't, if I don't have to do that, right. Nobody's forcing me to do that. So why would I? So I kind of resigned myself to this fact that I was going to be single forever. And then I met Allison and I was like, dang, like this is a situation where one plus one equals three, right? There is no fighting. There is no work. This is not a, this is not a chore for me. This is something that makes me better. And she feels the same way. Uh, so that's, that's been an awesome, awesome unlock that I, I never expected. It's kind of like a fairy tale thing where like, you don't know what love is until you find it. Hmm. There's one plus one equals three. Those things are rare. I'm wondering for you, is anything top of mind outside of that relationship that also has unlocked you like that? Yeah, I think spending time with high performing friends, you know, I, I think guys like you guys like my buddy Devin LeVake and Dan Churchill, where there's there's definitely ego involved, but it's also we make each other better, right? right? If De Devin and I are going to do a 5k race, like we're going to kill ourselves trying to beat each other, you know, and, and you're going to put up a, a much better time than than you would on your own, right? Or if I have an idea of Hey, I want to buy a ranch in Texas and build this amazing facility. Like I would never do that by myself. You call Devin, you become 50, 50 partners and you do it in six months. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and same deal. He wouldn't have done it by himself. So I think finding people who make you better, who force you to be better, who elevate your game. Um, and it's not like, don't, don't sink to the lowest common denominator. Like the cliche of like, you're an average of the five people you spend your time with. Like, I don't want to be measured by my college friends or my, my high school friends, right? I want to be measured by people who I look up to. Uh, so I think being fortunate enough to surround yourself with those high performers will elevate your game, no doubt. Walk me through one of those things. You, you see someone, you say, oh my gosh, in my head, that's someone I want to get closer to. That's someone I'd like to be more like. What do you then do? Follow on steps from there. Yeah, I, th I don't think it's 
as intentional as that, right? Like, I think you have to do the things that you're attracted to, right? Whether it's running races or showing up to events, you know, J Jesse itzler has got this event, 29029. You hike, you hike ski mountains in the US uh, 15 times until you get to the height of Mount Everest, 29,000, 29 feet. It's grueling, you know, it takes 15 to 24 hours. It's a brutal workout. And a couple of years ago, J my brother, Jake, Dan Churchill, Devin LeVake, and I all, all did it. We signed up for an event. We didn't know Jesse Itzler. Actually, you introduced me to Jesse back in like 2018 and I I, I pitched him, uh, but he never replied to my email. Jesse, you motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we didn't know him. So we show up at this event. Jesse comes and sits down to us and, and we're like, wow, we're hanging out with Jesse Itzler. This is awesome. And that never would have happened had I not grabbed four guys who were willing to challenge themselves and say yes to something crazy, show up and do it. And from that moment on, Jesse has become a friend, a mentor, an investor, an advisor, somebody who just inspires us so much. And I, I think you have to put yourself in those positions. And it's not just showing up, right? Like we were the guys who were running up the mountain when others were walking, right? You have to kind of do something different to stand out in a crowd of exceptional people. Yeah. You mentioned Jesse's become an awesome mentor for you. What are the best coaches and mentors done for you to get you to a higher level of performance and that could be either sport that could be business that could be personal i'm just wondering the consistency there yeah um i think opening up our eyes to what is possible uh one example with jesse so so devin and i built this ranch in austin and, and jesse came and checked it out we were sitting in the sauna one night we were giving them ideas. We we're like, hey, we, we can host these events here, right? We could charge people to come and enjoy a wellness weekend with guest speakers and all that. Uh, maybe we can do some weddings for 10 grand a ticket, 10 grand a rental. We could do some some Airbnb and get some some side income. He's like, man, fuck that. You guys aren't thinking big enough. He's like, you guys need to make this the, the Milken conference, right? Where you're charging CEOs $25,000 for one night events and, and Warren Buffett is, our, is the speaker and, and you got Michael Jordan there. I'm like, holy shit, like why? I didn't even think about that. Like, I, like that would never cross my mind, right? Like for, for us to interact with Michael Jordan and get him to an event, you know, I've never met Michael. Michael's a god and, and that probably won't happen. But the whole idea is we weren't thinking big enough and Jesse comes there and right away looks at this place and says, do this, do that, get an Airstream village down there, charge people rentals. Like it, it, it just unlocks what is possible. And I think advisors to me, or what I've gotten out of advice advisors is opening up my eyes to what is possible and, and shooting higher than we're currently aiming. So is that as a leader of a company, you got a lot of people underneath you. Is that one of the things you're trying to do most frequently is just open their eyes up to new possibilities? Yeah, or just remind them that like, we're here because we deserve to be here, right? Like we're, we're, we're doing something that's unique and, and unlikely and, and uncommon. And I think that uh, we we're here because we're doing the work. Like if you do the work and you're, and you're where you're at, like there is no imposter syndrome, right? Like you, you deserve to be where you are. If you're, if you're putting in the time and you're selling coffee in 50,000 stores and you're the number two brand on Amazon, like that's all results of the effort that the team puts in. And I mean, we say things that are are sort of tongue in cheek sometimes, like we're not going to sell our business to Starbucks. We're going to go acquire Starbucks, right? And and it's it's stuff like that that allows you to see what's possible. Um, and guess what? If you fall short of your goals, you're still landing in a really good good place. Uh, so I think pushing the team to do more than they they feel comfortable doing has been something that's that's gotten us pretty far. You mentioned when you set those goals, don't achieve them, you still end up in a good place. Any times come to mind for you where you set a big goal, didn't achieve it. And then I'm wondering what next steps look like for you after that failure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. The last couple of years, we've missed our revenue plans quite a bit. Like last year, our goal was 90 million in sales. We did 80 million in sales. And, but in 2018, we did 4 million in sales, right? So four years later, we're doing 80 million in sales and you feel, you feel like a bunch of losers because you fell $10 million short of your $90 million goal. And so I think by all accounts, like everybody is proud and impressed of us achieving 80 million last year, yet internally the team feels deflated and defeated and, and like we, we did something wrong or that we missed. So I, I think it's a good place that we landed where we landed. I think I got to do a better job of changing the mentality and the culture of, 
Yes, we fell short and we need to be so proud of what we all accomplished together because when you look to your left and to your right, there's not many people who who have done this or are doing this at our level. If you're looking back, what's one of the hardest things that you've done mentally? Hardest thing that I've done mentally. Oh man. Um, I think the training for the marathon, right? Like marathons freaking beauty pageant, right? You got three hours on race day, energy's high, you know, you're well hydrated, you got your snacks, like, like marathon, that's a beauty pageant. But the four months of track workouts on Wednesdays and hill workouts on Mondays and 20 mile runs on Saturdays, like that is a mental mess. Like physically you can do it, right? Especially it's a progression. So you build up to, to, to doing it, but going from zero, literally like the most I'd ever run was a, a, a 10 K to, to thinking about running 26 miles at a, at a fast pace is like, oh man, there's no way I'm going to do that. So I think for me, I want to, I'm, I'm the type of guy that wants to win the game on the first play. Right. So like, I'm very impatient in that regard. So building up that progression took a lot of mental discipline and like, showing up on a Saturday morning where all you wanted to do was like read a book and and have a cup of coffee showing up in the rain to go run 20 miles. Like that's not physical. Like that's, that's a mental battle. Uh, so I think signing up for something hard and then putting in the work to get ready for that has been the, the, the most difficult mental challenge. Who are those people you've looked to as models that can overcome those mental challenges almost every time? Chad, right. Uh, is, is the best example. Um, that was the Navy seal you mentioned earlier, right? Yeah, he's a Navy SEAL, um, great leader, amazing communicator, uh, but he just does endurance races and, and he doesn't do them. He wins them. Right. And and this is like last man standing type shit. Go run until you can't run anymore. And like he'll just he knows like that he, he doesn't he's not going to get tired. Right. He's not going to quit. He's not going to feel sorry for himself. And he'll go run for 36 hours and beat everybody else. He just did the uh, Coca Dona 250. 250 mile race in the mountains. Like he ran for four days straight. Uh, so like understanding that like that's 10 times farther than a marathon. You know, I, I think looking up to guys like that makes running a marathon a lot, a lot easier. Um, and, and now people are like, Oh, you got to do a hundred miler. No, I'm not doing a hundred miler. Are you kidding me? Like I have, I have zero interest in that, but people do them, you know, so find those people who do the unique things and, and they set the sort of stage for, for your own endurance. Okay, you've been around a lot of impressive people. And so you're attuned to certain things that other people, it wouldn't even pop up on their radar that you're observing when you're around some of those people. You're around Chad. You just mentioned he's capable of running these 200 plus mile races. What are you observing of him that stands out to you? Man, I think it's just keep going, right? It's one foot in front of the other, you know, and and it's there's no complaints. It's just doing the work and there's no secret, right? He's not looking for a silver bullet. He's not looking for innovation. He is just putting one foot in front of the other. Chad's the type of guy that says like, Chad, hey man, there's a mountain over there. You have to go move it, right? Whereas like a lot of people would be like, okay, let me get some dynamite. You know, let me get some some heavy machinery. We'll get some some equipment, you know, like we'll get some some backhoes and some excavators in here. Uh, and Chad's like, all right. And he just goes and gets one stone and he puts it over there. He gets another stone and he puts it over there. And after he moves all the stones, he realizes that he moved the mountain, you know, and, and that's the way to do it. I think, I think for me, it's such a good reminder that there is no secret. You're not going to blow the mountain up, right? Like you have to do the work. Um, and it's, it's just a, hum it's a humbling reminder because the work is hard. You know, the, the, the basics are simple. They're just not easy. Mm. Jim, I was pulling up, getting ready for this conversation. I, I ended up sending this to you. It's a picture of my notes after we met. So this was five plus years ago and I was thinking about an investment. And so I just jotted down basically kind of breaking down the way I thought about you. There were a few things on there and I'm curious to get your take now. So one of the things I said is what drives him? Question mark. For you looking back, what is that internal motivator, that driver that has been pushing you consistently over all these years? I think it's twofold. I think the more noble answer is not letting my teammates down. Right. I, I, I feel like we have a responsibility to each other and I have a responsibility as the leader to not let the people down who, whether it's investors or employees or, or even customers, not letting those people down, I think, is the noble answer. I think the selfish answer is ego mm -hmm. in that what we're doing, people, it, it, it can't usually be done. Right. People are like, oh you're not going to do that. You're not going to succeed at that. All the odds are against you. So I think whether it's running a marathon or, or, or building a business, 
the odds are against you. And I, I kind of like that. You know, I like I like the challenge of, of not proving people wrong. I think it's more proving myself right, like showing showing what, what we can do. So I think ego is is a good motivator. Uh, and yeah, that those are those are two things that probably the two biggest things that drive me amongst a bunch of little things as well. Was there a moment early on for you where you had a realization about yourself that you had capabilities? And just so everyone knows, I have the belief that we all have these capabilities. It's more around the awareness of them where you realized and you held yourself in a higher light because you realized that there was something inside of you that you could bring out. Dude, it's a, it's a good question. And it's a deep question. And un unfortunately, I, I often suffer in thinking about like placing all of my attention on the things that I don't have or the things that I lack, you know, not, not things, not material things, but s securities and confidence and, and technical skills in certain areas, you know, like I, I place more of my emphasis on that internally. It's, it's something that I'm working hard to overcome. I think the, the thing that I, I, I don't take for granted is the influence I have on others, you know, and that's, that's sort of come naturally, right. I was the, the, the captain of my college football team. I was the president of my class. I was like a, just sort of a natural leader of the, the groups and the cliques and the communities that I belonged to ever since I was a little eager, you know, and, and I, I don't know what that is, but people wanted to follow me. People were inspired by, by me. And, and it sounds arrogant hearing myself say that, but there's, there's real power in that, you know, and there's real, real influence in that. And I haven't really found a, a sort of systematic way to, to harness it, but I do, I do notice it now. Um, and I, I sort of leverage it where I can, uh, but I got, I still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. The, the work never stops. That's one of yeah. actually the things I'm literally looking at this screenshot of uh, the sheet I had on you. And one of the things to start is compounds, the aggregation of marginal gains, meaning you continue to go at these little things that compound and build up over time. And like you said, it's these small little things that you focus on. Jim, we're going to round this out in a minute, but I would love to know, you, you mentioned one of the books you're reading now, Follow Me to Hell. Have there been any other books or people, information that has just been impactful for you in terms of how you approach your life? Yes, it happens to be sitting here. I swear this is not a plug and I was not expecting this question, but the best book I read in the last two years is Smart Brevity. This is the found, from the founders of Politico and Axios. And it's basically... How do you say more with less? It's how do you trim down your emails? How do you communicate effectively? How do you write an effective subject in, a, in an email? How do you present uh, effectively? And it's taking, if you write an email that's 250 words, it turns it into 50 words that say the same exact thing. Uh, so for any of you out there that wants to be better at whatever it is that you do, go read Smart Brevity. You're going to love it. One of the books that has never come up on this podcast, also one I need to read because that is, I am exhausted in my writing, my things like that. So it'd be extremely helpful. Jim, say you could do this though. Deep interview with anyone dead or alive. Who would you love to sit down with an interview? No brainer. Teddy Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. That dude was the American dream, right? He was a politician. He was an athlete. He was a war hero. He was a conservationist uh teddy teddy did like he he represented what it meant to be an american uh back in the early early 1900s late 1800s so um i would i would love I, i've read everything there is to read on teddy and and would love to spend time with him mm. say someone's doing an interview and describing jim DeSico in 100 years what are you hoping they bring up you just said all those great things about teddy i think determined uh, I think he persevered through, through challenges, right? He, he fought for what he believed in. Um, that's something that I aspire for, toward right now is, is being more convicted in my beliefs, uh, and, and fighting for those beliefs. So I think perseverance and I think determination, uh, and, and certainly compassionate throughout, throughout that process. Jim, I just had to pull this up because this is the note I have on Theodore Roosevelt. This is a quote about him. He was so alive at all points and so gifted with the rare faculty of living intensely and entirely of every moment as it passed. That is one I love because the intensity of life, that is something I've seen you do, Jim, over the years. You go after it. You don't hold things back and you try to make the most of this, these moments. So Jim DeSico, it's been an honor to have you on a third time. Anywhere we, you want to direct the listeners, where they can stay connected with you, everything you and the brothers are building at Super Coffee. 
Yeah, man. Sean, I appreciate it, brother. Check us out at Drink Super Coffee. Uh, my brothers and I are doing more videos. We're doing these fun sort of sugar exposure videos lately. Uh, but Instagram, Drink Super Coffee is, is the best place to uh, to stay connected. <laughs>